started having struggles with my faith in early high school, maybe late middle school, a speaker at a youth event told me that anyone I failed to convert to Christianity was going to spend eternity in hell, burning forever in a lake of fire and eternal conscious torment, and it would be my fault. It was like a crack in the glass of a window. You know, I went to youth events, sometimes traveling hundreds and hundreds of miles to attend youth events that were being attended by thousands of kids my own age, where it felt like my emotional buttons were being pushed. You know, like, have you ever watched like a, like a TV show or a movie where it felt more like the writers were simply trying to pull out the emotions they wanted you to feel more than they actually wanted to write something authentic. You know, like they have cheat codes to make you cry. It, it kind of felt like that. Like there were event organizers behind the scenes who had meticulously crafted these events to make me feel the way they wanted to, as if that was a good enough substitute instead of trying to help me experience anything real, anything divine, anything deeper and bigger and wiser than myself. You know, some people call it the spark, some people call it the engine, the divine, the universe, God, whatever name works best for you. And every time I felt that manufactured sanctity, another crack began to form in this window of my religion. Another crack formed when I went to Bible college for a year. There, there were these pious students who were overzealous in their holier-than-thou attitudes. One, one student had memorized the entirety of the book of 1 Corinthians, and another student had read every single Billy Graham book and sermon he could get his hands on. And it didn't feel like they did it because they wanted to. You know, there was a desire to draw closer to God. And they did it because they thought they had to, because they were on the path to be the best Christians in the world, which meant competing with other Christians over who could be the best. You know, they wanted to beat me over the head with their holiness. It was like some sick and toxic Christ-ordained dick measuring contest and I wanted no part in it. You know, I had professors who told me that they, what they taught was the utmost truth. And then we read Bible verses about how every single person who has ever lived or will live is faulty and small and cannot possibly begin to comprehend the vast mystery of an infinitely big universe and an even bigger God, I had someone who told me I was going to hell because I wanted to get a tattoo while they ate a shrimp salad and wore mixed fabric clothing. I had a professor tell me that he doubted the authenticity of my relationship with God because I didn't subscribe to the exact theology he did. I, I had another student tell me that he knew God had caused the Sandy Hook shooting to happen because, quote, God's ways are not our ways and God had a purpose that would come about. So God had ordained that man to kill those little kids. You know, still more cracks began to form as I learned the history of this tradition that I seem so set on attaching myself to, you know, when Christianity willingly got into bed with the powers that be, with with empires and kings and nations, and, and worst of all, corporations and CEOs and capitalism, I saw how the image of the crucified Christ had been turned into a symbol of coercive power. The image of Christ had been used to enact violence and scandal. Here in North America, on Turtle Island, the disruption uh, and destruction of so much indigenous culture and spirituality. I thought that the worst cracks had come in 2016 with our president, a man who was so openly racist and sexist, homophobic and bigoted, a man who cheated on his multiple wives, who openly objectified women, who could barely even talk about his faith without making it evident that he didn't know anything about this historical ancient tradition that people had been partaking in for thousands of years, who, who called murderers and clan members very fine people and then lumped them together with the marginalized communities who 
were protesting the unjust deaths of their brothers and sisters at the hands of the stake. This was the man that churches seemed to froth at the mouth and scream at the top of their lungs about his holiness and how he was a shining example for devotion to God. He was righteous. He was for all intents and purposes the second coming of Christ himself to some of these people. I once saw a billboard of Trump on a cross with flames all around him and the words, if only the rest of the world knew the truth. Like, what the hell does that even mean? And, and why were so few people who, who claim to follow Christ not screaming at the top of their lungs about the deification of someone who wasn't their God? Did taking the Lord's name in vain mean nothing? Did having no other God before Yahweh mean nothing when it came to Trump? I was a pastor for, for nine years, and in a lot of ways, I would still consider myself a pastor, just a pastor without a church. But in my time as a, a, a formal pastor, I've had a lot of cracks form in my window. I felt cracks when I sit with someone who's been wounded by the church. I've, I've heard pastors callously denounce people openly, publicly, sometimes from their pulpits with a spotlight on their face, up high on a stage, denouncing individuals for failing to live up to their standards of doctrine or, or theological purity. And on January 6, 2021, the biggest crack yet formed on my window to such an extent that I, I wondered if I should just smash out the window myself and, and buy a new one because I questioned whether or not I could salvage what was left. I'm sure we all remember that day to some extent. And it was, but it was frustrating and heartbreaking and infuriating and bewildering how when I would talk to so many people after January 6th, especially when I would talk to Christians, even friends and loved ones who, who pastored or, or led different kind of ministries, their reactions just rubbed me the wrong way. You know, they said things like, oh, well, it was newsworthy. It was monumental. It was something we'd be talking about for a long time. And all of that is fine. All of that is true. I'm not trying to say otherwise, but it just seemed like a lot of the Jesus-loving people I talked to in the days that followed January 6th didn't really want to talk about it. And they certainly didn't want to talk about the spiritual implications of it. But, but how could you not? There was something haunting in the footage. This, this MAGA army storming the Capitol with their fear and their anger and their thirst for political power and control. You know, I read an article about how white supremacists knelt down to pray for victory before standing up and yelling at journalists and camera operators to get the hell out of their way. I listened to a preacher ranting to a crowd of supporters, telling them that it was time to take the country back in Jesus' name. I watched footage of a guard being crushed to death, crying out for help without a good Samaritan in their midst offering to help. I saw a picture of a sea of anger and violence and struggle. And amidst that sea of vile hatred, someone held up a handmade sign that said, Jesus saves. The white supremacists prayed in Jesus' name. The, the, the preacher raving in fury but wanting to take the nation back was doing so in Jesus' name, using the language that I use, that my, my father uses, my mother uses, my family and friends and mentors and loved ones use. To top it all off, as much as I might have, have wanted to denounce and distance myself from them, I couldn't get the image out of my head of this great, big, blood-soaked tether stretching from my heart and connecting me to these people who were filled with violence and arrogance and hate. And it was seemingly my religion that connected us. We shared some sort of sick spiritual DNA and it felt like as if, if there was blood on their hands and there was blood on mine too. It's been, it's been two and a half years and I'm still 
angry? How did a faith that started with the liberation of slaves, whose heroes include sex workers who trust in the Lord and religious zealots who repent from their sinful ways turn into something so unbelievably boring. The central images of Christianity are one, a common table where all are welcome and brought together into the radical family of God that reconciles across all lines, including race, gender, and class. And two, an abused, dark-skinned man publicly executed on a cross in an unfair trial by the state and by the religious powers of the day, who through his resurrection became the very sign of God's presence, God's upside down power structure, and God's willingness to co-suffer with humanity. I'm furious that they hijack something so beautiful and bizarre only to turn it into something so selfish and hateful. And I'm sad. I'm sad that the Bible and the church, which were meant to bind up the wounds of humanity, has been used as blunt force weapons against those who God loves. I'm sad when I sit with people who have been hurt by the church, and especially the fact that it seems to be a resounding unifier of more and more people these days. More people who have been hurt by the church. I'm tired. I am so tired of trying to articulate why I think, why I have always thought, why I still think that this faith is beautiful when the loudest voices are anything but. In fact, the loudest voices are, are crude and vile and ignorant. I'm tired of being respectful to churches I disagree with while they get to say whatever they want. I'm tired of having to tell people, oh, I, I'm a Christian, but I'm not that kind of Christian. And I'm try I'm tired of trying to convince myself and others that those kinds of Christians are not linked to me because despite my protests, we are tied in faith and in baptism, we are tied. I have days where these thoughts are heavier and, and days where it doesn't even cross my mind anymore. You know, I've had moments of beauty and felt myself bask in the glow that felt like it was coming from a spirit that was larger than myself, a spirit calling me into a tradition that stretched back to the beginning of time. Like I was joining a choir of ancestors from generations before me to sing a song of hope and liberation and the beauty of all of it. And other days, when I wake, I have this fear that maybe I've just been fooling myself. And maybe the God I have devoted my life to really does love this hatred, this violence, this vile, mean, nasty attitude and actions of the megaphone preachers and the MAGA army, the QAnoners and the white supremacists. Because there's no end of people who try and convince anyone that would listen that, that God really is that God. So today is one of those bad days for me, which is why I'm, I'm filming this little sermon alone in my room online, because I am angry and I am sad and tired of this thing we so often call Christianity. You know, when I was in youth group, my youth pastor and a big mentor in my life told me that oftentimes he would consider himself not necessarily a Christian, but a follower of Jesus which was kind of a sort of nuanced take I didn't really appreciate at the time, but something I've thought a lot about over the years. He loved Jesus. He loved what Jesus had to say. He wanted to follow Jesus, but he struggled with Jesus's fan base, you know, ruining it for everyone. And who can blame him and, and countless other people for thinking like that? You know, I'd be lying if I said there hasn't been times when someone has asked me my beliefs or my faith and I have stumbled over some sort of non-committal but non-denying string of descriptors trying to say how I follow Jesus. But again, I'm not one of those Christians. And sometimes I identify even more as a Jesus follower and not a Christian. But it seems odd to call myself a Jesus follower because it's like splitting hairs into most people. What's the difference between a Jesus follower and a Christian anyway? And, well, which immediately after that ramble, big hunk of meaninglessness, I would immediately see the blank expression on their face saying, I was really only looking for a one word answer there, not really a life story. 
which would then also be followed up on my part by guilt because it would make me feel like Peter after he denied Jesus for fear of being crucified along with Jesus. And so why stay in this mess? Why endure this kind of train wreck? Why call myself or continue to call myself a Christian? Is it even worth it? Well, I did what I always do when struggling with questions and doubts, or, or what I always try to do. I do have a nine-month-old baby after all, so it's kind of hard, but I meditated. I, I sat down in a, cry, a quiet room, I played some music, and I just thought about these questions. Who am I? What do I believe? Where do I fall? Where do I stand? And after a lot of thought, I came upon some things that really helped me, and you know, maybe they'll help you. Two, the scriptures are candid about the failure of God's people to act like God's people and are also very candid about God's reactions and feelings towards these people when they fail to act like God's people. You know, Jesus channels that idea in, in the New Testament when confronting the spiritually powerful and religious leaders in his own time. And just as Jesus confronted his Jewish peers, I think he continues to confront Christians who have missed or corrupted his message. You know, the scriptures have a way of echoing truth through time, so that even though those of us born thousands of years after the very last words were written, we can hear his words as equally relevant and challenging in our own context. So in Matthew 23 verses 13 through 15 and 23 through 25 and then in 27 it says, But woe to you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven. For you do not go in yourselves, and when others are going in, you stop them. Woe to you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you devour, devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance you make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive the greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you cross sea and land to make a single convert, and you make the new convert twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and faith. It is those you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you clean the outside of a cup and of the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. There is a time and a place where sometimes those who are powerful or high up in the religion need to be shut down. And I, I'd argue that before the end of the Gospels, Jesus would tell each and every one of us who follow him that he is entrusting his power to us. He asks us to do as he did and more. And if that's too much for you, then simply take these words of Jesus from Matthew and apply them to the religious leaders of today and just cut me and what I'm saying right out of this whole process. The point is that sometimes being the loudest, having the most Bible verses memorized, being the most assured of who is in and who is out, and having every door you see open to you within the walls of Christianity doesn't mean that you are not a whitewashed tomb. It doesn't mean that you are not spick and span on the outside, but absolutely dead and rotting on the inside. Jesus knew that the point of a tradition was not to defend itself or build itself up as if the end goal of all of this is to make the best religion in town. The aim of true religion is not to battle for your tribal God, but to be transformed by a living, breathing God. It doesn't help us avoid loss or suffering or death, but instead it sends us right into the heart of it so that we can descend into the places of darkness and encounter Christ 
who is the Lord of the living and the dead. And through our encounter with Christ in the darkest and most painful of experiences of our life, we can receive resurrection here, now, resurrection each and every new day. Which might be why I believe that those who have experienced the most trials, who have never fit into the Christian religious industrial institution and complex, are often those who have most encountered the living God. The black church witnesses to a God who is wild and free. In church basements across the world, participants of Alcoholics Anonymous encounter a God of foolishly free and abundant grace in a way many who only stick to the pews on Sunday mornings never will. Our queer siblings in Christ have experienced more than their fair share of shame and judgment, and again and again, Christ meets them in their rejection because he knows a thing or two about being unfairly judged. And this is why people like me, people with privilege and institutional power need to be in relationship with those who suffer because it's those people who continually get the absolute shit kicked out of them by the very followers of a God who preaches nothing above love who witness to me how beautiful our God is. It's the people who by all common sense should want nothing to do with this tradition, who should want nothing to do with the God we call Yahweh, who pick me up when I am wallowing in my own self-pity and show me what real strength and real faith and real grace actually is. You can only experience resurrection when you encounter death, be it physical, emotional, psychological. You can only encounter death when you no longer have power and control. This is the beautiful underside of Christianity, the hidden places where Christ has always played, but which we have so often avoided. How beautiful would it be if instead of rioting for their own rights, every self-proclaimed Christian began by imitating Jesus by co-suffering alongside their black, brown, indigenous women, intersex, queer, poor, sick, imprisoned neighbor? You know, maybe some of the systemic problems facing our nation would resolve. But not only that, but maybe our spiritual poverty would resolve itself as well. The challenge in all of this is what Stephen Pressfield calls in the War of Art as resistance. And he spells it with a capital R, resistance. Those of you who have read the book might know about the idea of resistance. And those of you from a Christian upbringing or background, you might see parallels of resistance to what scripture calls the accuser or the slanderer or the Satan. Pressfield says that the only way to win a battle of life is to know your enemy, and the enemy of the soul is resistance. If you want to go for a run, if you want to make a difficult phone call, if you want to get to the project, and yet everything within you is doing all it can to simply push you the other way, that is resistance. Resistance only kicks in when you are walking towards God and the kingdom, and to put it a different way, if those words are a little charged for you, resistance kicks in when you are walking with the wind of the spirit, the will of the universe, when the spark is beginning to catch fire, when the engine is humming beautifully, when all is right in the world and you are on your way in life, resistance is going to kick in. Yet if you're walking away from all of that, it's going to be so much easier. You know, want to volunteer at a soup kitchen or, or fight for affordable housing or for fairer wages or go to a protest or wake up early to do morning devotions or, or go work out after a long and grueling day of work, you're going to feel some resistance. Want to go get high every night and binge Netflix? You're not going to find a lot of resistance. And obviously there are caveats to this. There's a difference between the resistance of a good thing and the struggle of doing something that you are so 
intently not made to do. You know, an artist born to paint is going to struggle in a job in economics simply because it's not what they're supposed to be doing. That struggle you feel engaging with a toxic and abusive person is not the tug of resistance showing that this person needs you and you should actually be spending time with them, but instead it's the struggle you feel because that person is horrible and to be around them is painful and you should probably leave them. You know, I'm not advocating that we live in a head down, nose to the grindstone, burn yourself out kind of lifestyle. Sometimes you need to take a break and watch TV or scroll on your phone or just do something that doesn't actually take any work something meaningless, but choosing to do anything real, anything substantive and worthwhile in this world is always going to be met with resistance. It's always going to be harder than doing something meaningless. You know, if you pause to consider where resistance is working in your life, it's a pretty big indicator of where the spirit is moving and calling you to go. Still doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it might just be right. What does resistance have to do with everything else I've said today? Good question. I feel that like after four years of Trump's America, three years of Biden's America, three years of a global pandemic that's just kickstarting back up again, the constant doom scrolling and just everything we've been subjected to the last few years, it is very, 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 very easy to see it all and run away from it. Turn your back on it and just go with the flow of water in the opposite direction and get further and further away. Cut your losses, stop being a Christian, find something else. And I'm not going to lie to you, if that's you right now, I cannot say I blame you. But I had this moment where all I wanted to do was run, to turn around and go in the opposite direction. I felt that resistance trying to tell me that it would just be so much easier to move away from it all. But I looked behind me and I saw the twisted bent and beat up heart of Christianity and I knew that there was something there that was actually worth fighting for, worth clinging to. And so that's what I'm trying to do. I started asking myself what would it look like to reclaim my faith, to give myself over to the work of Christ in the particular way of Christianity, to put my energy, my prayers, my meditation, my resources, my intention, my body into the gradual, slow, relational work of reclaiming this beautiful tradition, to stop trying to fix the crack in my window when, when they form, but to let it fall apart and perhaps for the first time feel the freedom of the spirit as she rushes against my face, to stop trying so hard to scrub the blood off my own hands so that Christ can clean them for me himself. That this ancient path has been well worn by, by mystics and prophets and pilgrims through time and space and quite frankly I refuse to let it be hijacked by the loudest, proudest, and most bloated bullying voices in my time. I want to reclaim Christianity in my own life and in my own city as the beautiful gift it was always meant to be. That's what I'm going to try and focus on for the next few months. I want to talk about the basics, the core elements of Christianity, the building blocks of faith, belief, religion, Religion and spirituality. You know, what would it what would it look like to reclaim it and live it in a more Christ-centric way, from doctrine to evangelism to devotions and worship? I want to name the way these gifts have been corrupted by unclean spirits like colonialism and bullying and coercion, and maybe find a way to carve forward a space where we can recapture the beauty, the wonder, and the love that has been waiting for us, all, all of us, all along. However, I don't really want to do this alone. Obviously, I'm speaking to a camera and posting it on the internet, but I, I don't want this to be static, to just be a flat, uncomprehended, uninternalized piece of media. You know, if you have questions, if you have follow-ups, if you have thoughts, and you want to engage deeper, more meaningfully, if you want to have conversations, please reach out. You know, you can comment down below. You can send me a message on Instagram at, at Brennan H. Johnson. You know, I, I really hope to hear from you, and I really hope 
this helps. So I'll just say grace and peace. Cheers. <laughs>